we're live! Welcome everybody to number two in a series of webinars from the Japan Saki and Shochu Makers Association. My name is Philip Duff and I'm here to explain a little bit about what Shochu is. We're going to conduct a tasting of some particular types of Shochu and then hand over to some of the best bartenders in America and indeed the world to show you how they apply this to cocktails. It's fun and educational, and it could help you get a trip to Japan because the Kyushu Shochu Makers Association are running a cocktail competition. For all details on this, look at www.shochu.guide. That's www.shochu.guide. So, time to get down to business. I'm going to do a quick shochu 101 before our tasting so if you're already an expert on shochu by all means skip this grab a beer have a coffee but we're going to run through everything basic that you need to know about shochu and simply to understand what it is that we're going to be tasting and also the inspirations behind the cocktails that our bartenders will be demonstrating today so <laughs> shochu 101 the basics the first record of distilled spirits being drunk at all in Japan is from a Portuguese traveler in 1546. He used the term Araki for it as a general term for distilled spirits, but almost certainly what he was talking about was what we would now call shochu. And brilliantly, the second oldest mention of shochu in Japan, which actually mentioned shochu by name, is two workmen who were hired to fix a shrine in Japan, and they wrote graffiti, which you can still see today, saying the priest was so stingy, he didn't even give us any shochu, which I think is absolutely fantastic. Now, you can make shochu over all of Japan, as you can see, Tokyo, Fukushima, Niigata, Nagano, but the spiritual and production heart is the Kyushu region, centered around places like Okinawa, Miyazaki, Kagoshima, Kumamoto, and Iki Island. These are essentially the Caribbean islands of, uh, of Japan, and things are, are tropical there. You are closer to Taiwan and Thailand than you are to Tokyo. Things grow differently. You can even grow sugarcane down there. So it's very different, perhaps, to anything you might have uh, seen of Japan before on your trips there. So, whoops. Oh, this is weird. I can't even advance my own. Oh, there we go. So what is shochu? So it's a distilled spirit. 70, 75% of all the shochu that is drunk in Japan is made from either barley, sweet potato, or rice. But you can actually make it from about 23 different other ingredients, including things like sugar or kelp or even sesame seed. It's sacrificed with an asparagus mold called koji. We're going to be talking about koji in a moment. What the koji does, though, it converts starches into sugar, which gives the yeast something to convert into alcohol. Great. But koji also produces citric acid, which has two functions. It wards off bacterial infections, which isn't as important now because you have very hygienic production facilities, but hundreds of years ago, you did not. Also, high citric acid ferments give absolutely delicious, amazing distillates. It's much the same, for instance, with uh, wine and cognac. The wine that's used to make cognac is very, very uh, citrusy. And honestly, you wouldn't want to drink this wine, but you all want to drink that cognac. So. There's a couple of types of shochu, and you can compare it very closely to whiskey types. So there is single distilled pot still shochu, which is called honkaku shochu. It's been called honkaku shochu for 50 years. Before that, it was called utsurai. It has to be bottled at 45% alcohol or less, so 90 proof or less. Now, the column still shochu is called korowai. And it's been called Korowai since about 1953. It uses a column still, and it has to be bottled at less than 36%. If you blend the two together, you get blended shochu, right, which is called konwa shochu. And depending how much honkaku shochu you have, it's either called uh, otsurai korowai konwa, if you have 51% or more of the good stuff. And if you have 49% or less, it's called korowai otsurai konwa. 
And Honkaku Shochu has had a huge boom in Japan in the last 20 or 30 years. Japanese people have rediscovered it. And in fact, Japan now drinks more shochu than it drinks sake, which is amazing. <laughs> Once you've made it, you don't have to age shochu at all, but you can rest it. And it usually is rested in either stainless steel or ceramics or glass, or you can also rest or even age it in wooden barrels. Ah, this gets really interesting when you talk about barley shochu. Most of what's consumed in Japan is bottled at 25% or so, so 50 proof. And Awamori from the Ruku Islands, which center around Okinawa, is kind of like the mezcal to shochu's tequila. It's a single fermentation, black koji, shochu made from long grain Thai rice, indica rice, and it's usually bottled around 40% ABV, 80 proof. And something really important, especially since I'm speaking to a load of health conscious Californians out there. Hello, everyone. There is no added sugar in shochu of any kind, and there are no carbohydrates as well. So there is no such thing as healthy alcohol. It doesn't exist, but if it did, it would look a whole lot like shochu. So generally speaking, the use of raw materials centers around places where they are in abundance. So in the north, you got more use of barley and sesame. In the south, you got more use of sweet potatoes, which of course came to Japan via uh, South America, most likely with Portuguese travelers. You've got more use of soba and rice in the middle. And there's so many odd things that you can make shochu from, including buckwheat and kelp even. However, koji is where it's all at. This fungus makes shochu production more efficient, more consistent, and more delicious. In fact, once upon a time, we came this close to there being an official method of making whiskey in America using koji as well. And it was really just the combinations of World War I and II and people getting distracted because otherwise we'd be making bourbon and rye using koji. What koji does is a parallel fermentation to supply enzymes to convert starches into sugar, supply citric acid, which is great for flavor. And depending on which koji you use, you generally get a different result of the fermentation. So yellow koji tends to be more fruity, black koji is more muscular and earthy, white koji, and we're going to taste some white koji shochu today, is a little more delicate and subtle. Now, koji, these aspergillus mold spores, need something to live on. And if you're a bartender, it's almost certainly that you've opened your fridge and found some mold growing on something. So you know that molds can grow on anything. Now, most koji is grown on rice uh, mold. It feeds on it so it can propagate. But you could grow koji on anything. One of the uh, shochus we'll be tasting later is Ichiko. And Ichiko's koji is propagated on barley. And the shochu is also based on barley. So you grow the shochu, sorry, you grow the koji on whatever host you like, let's say it's usually uh, rice, and you do it in a koji room, like, like this beautiful koji room here. In these boxes, all the koji is stacked up. It feeds and grows and propagates until you've got enough to use it in the first uh, fermentation, the first maromi. But what happens here is that the yeast, the koji, and the water are all mixed together in one of these huge ceramic containers. And the uh, shochu maker stirs it all up and watches it, just as anybody would watch a fermentation. Because what you're doing here is propagating the yeast and the koji. You're growing them with warmth and water until they're absolutely raring to go. And then they enter the second Maromi fermentation, where you add the raw ingredient, whatever it might be, barley, sweet potato, rice, buckwheat, sesame, whatever it is. And then in a parallel sense, the, sh 
Kochi converts starches into sugar, supplies citric acid too. The yeast converts the uh, sugars into alcohol and you ferment so much faster, more efficiently and with greater depth of flavor than just using yeast alone. So distillation typically happens uh, one to two times and it can happen in a regular pot still or in a pot still that's in reduced pressure, a vacuum pot still, like a very large rotavap, if you're familiar with that. The use of vacuum stills came to Japan in the 1950s, and they became very popular in shochu distilleries, as much as a third of the distilleries use them, because it enables you to bring out flavors more delicate that wouldn't survive a regular atmospheric pressure distillation. And once you've distilled your shochu, like we said earlier, you store it. You can store it in ceramic vessels like this, in glass or stainless steel, or you can store it in a cave. Many shochu and our Mori producers use a local cave or dig a cave like this one. It goes down and down and down. And everyone who buys a 1.8 liter bottle of the shochu has the option to store it. Just like Mezcal Madarado in Mexico, people buy these bottles to commemorate big events in their life, be it getting married or having a baby or whatever. And the distillery will store it for you and you can come back 20 years later or 30 or 40 and pick out your bottle and drink it with your wife or your uh, son or your daughter. So if you look closely at a lot of these labels, they've actually got pictures of people's wedding days or babies on them. Not gonna lie, it does get a little creepy down there. So, in Japan itself, a lot of people like drinking shochu straight or in simple mixes. So there's sutorito, which is straight, onzanroku, on the rocks, misawari with water, and you shouldn't have a favorite, but this is my favorite, oyawari, shochu with hot water. Until you've mixed it, you have not drunk shochu. This is the most delicious way. You don't need bitters, you don't need sugar, you don't need a lemon slice or anything like this. Oyawari is the way to go. Sodawari is, of course, delicious too. And you may have heard of uh, chuhai, which is shochu high balls. These are really popular in Japan, especially when they're canned as an RTD. And it's typically the korowai column still shochu, which is lower in alcohol and has less flavor, combined with uh, sodas and fruits and things like that. Think of it as kind of their vodka soda, if you will. And those are very, very tasty drinks. So on to our tasting. So uh, we're joined here by my mate Aaron Klein from Pabu Izakaya, also out there on the left coast in San Francisco. Uh, Aaron, how's things, mate? Fantastic. Beautiful day. Yeah. Glad so apart from uh, having one of the most extensive show to lists I've seen anywhere, on the uh, Pabu menu, I was looking at it the other day. You're in San Francisco, probably the uh, the most shochu drinking place in America, conceivably, maybe neck and neck with Japan. So, how does it roll in your bar? How do people get into it? Well, we do highballs. A lot of people just drink it over the rocks. We've served it with hot water, like you're mentioning, your favorite, and uh, cocktails as well. Oh, brilliant. Uh, do you get a lot of people just tasting it on its own? Uh, we will do a tasting for anyone that wants to try it. Absolutely. Um, you know, we we're actually going through some of my favorites today. Yeah, we got some heavy hitters now and uh, we're kind of doing a, a mini Ichiko flight. So Ichiko is made by the Sanwe Shurawai distillery, very, very large distillery in Japan that I've had the privilege of visiting. It's absolutely gorgeous. There's mandarin trees on the property. And this is one of the best selling uh, shochus in Japan. So uh, you have the advantage of me, Aaron. You've got a full size bottle. Uh, I was rushing a little bit. So I have, I have the miniature version here. But let's, uh, let's pour out a little bit and take a nose and a taste and sort of see what we get out of it. So 50 proof, 25%. So, 
I find this uh, quite delicate, which I tend to see a lot with uh, white koji shochus. And a little twist is that Ichiko uses both low pressure and atmosphere level distillation. But on the other hand, it's a barley shochu, and you usually expect that to be very brawny. So overall, my description is to be sophisticated. What do you think, Aaron? I love it. It's, it's very complex. I get notes of white pepper. Uh, barley, absolutely. Um, jasmine tea, white peach, high minerality. Yeah, there's a slight salinity there on the finish. And there's a, a kind of a tropical fruits thing in the beginning. It doesn't develop perhaps as far as it could. But again, zero sugar, zero carbohydrates. You know, this is something that gives you a lot of jumping off points. And we're not just doing this to make uh, Kevin jealous because he doesn't have a bottle. This kind of <laughs> this kind of leads us in to what you and me are going to try out, Kevin. So let's flip things around. And why don't you kick us off with uh, our next tasting? Yeah, so we've got the, the Chico Saitan, one of my favorite uh, mixable ones, just because it's a little higher proof uh, as opposed to the little lower proof, uh, 25%. Uh, silhouettes and the uh, the other uh, sochus out there. So that you got on the screen there, the, the Chico Saitens, super delicious. So um, I have a bottle, you have a bottle. I think we should maybe have a little taste together. And I'm super festive, so I'm going to taste in my little Christmas mug <laughs> here. Of course you are, which are available for purchase <laughs> at Cocktail Kingdom with the, and at yes. Miracle at PCH, people. Yes. Please don't steal them. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so a little uh, tastes like smells like Christmas, um, but not really. But nose is always so great. I always love um, a Chico and the the barley because the barley always makes me think of like, like if you smell it, it almost smells like Honey Nut Cheerios a little bit. Like it reminds me kind of like a white dog, a bit like a white dog. Meme for Quite oh, so good. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you get that, get that ni nice, like citrusy acid to it, but also that nice velvety texture of most sochus get. So higher proof. So always pushes a little more flavors fire forward when you have something a little more higher proof to 80, especially with sochu. Anything over, over anything over 100 is absolutely amazing because you're pushing so much more flavor out. Um, but nicely balanced. Again, you're getting like honeydew melon, white pepper. I think that's kind of like an underlining same in, same common theme with a lot of the Ichiko sochus, which is great. Um, but a lot of savory notes, right? Because you're getting a lot of that, that koji and that umami that we like to say a lot of times, uh, umami. So you're mixing this thing great together where you're getting something citrusy, bright, but also that underlying koji and umami on there, which makes it so great to mix. Yeah, I mean, anytime we take bartenders to Japan, and I hope Aaron and Kevin, that you guys can come with us when the skies open up again. Uh, they taste full strength shochu or aromori, and that's it, that's all they want. So I happen to know that Saizen, which means colorful sky, was specifically developed for uh, mixologists. Uh, its global launch was here in the USA, so we've been very fortunate. And when I taste this, it's kind of like Ichiko Silhouette, but HD. Everything is yeah. dialed up. You know, it's, it's like so good. Johnny Walker Double Black versus Johnny Walker Black. You know, you've got that prickle. You've got that finish. The fruits are brighter. The, the jasmine's more aromatic. What do you think, Aaron? Briny, pickled watermelon peel. That's it. Yeah. Mm hmm. And I'm sure it tastes even better from that uh, Christmas mug, which you totally shouldn't steal from Miracle <laughs> at PCH. Get no. in early, people, because there's a line every day. <laughs> every day. Every day. So, Kevin, do you want to take us over the jumps uh, with the cocktails that you've created with this? And more importantly, for people watching who might want to enter that competition and come to Japan with us, yeah. the process by which you kind of came up with it, having tasted yeah, the show that you used. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, we use it. We, when over at PCH, we, we've used it uh, several times in several different ways in, in cocktails. Uh, the one cocktail we have on the menu at PCH when we reopened in February was the 1000 cranes. Um, so we took the Saitan, we infused it with a little bit of cucumber, and the cucumber and the honeydew and melons together are, are this perfect harmony of 
kind of playing off each other and trying to stack the flavors together um, and make it refreshing. So when I think about Soshu and trying to do something approachable um, and it not being a generally consumed beverage from the normal consumer that comes in, um, cocktails is the best vessel to, to introduce people into a spirit that they're not familiar with. Um, so I always think of trying to make it into a long cocktail to introduce to someone to drink it first as a long cocktail or in a citrus based cocktail because those are a lot more approachable for people. Uh, that way you can balance the flavors in there and push out unfamiliar flavors with familiar flavors with people because that's how you get people to drink cocktails. Um, so I like to kind of balance it to, to the two between savory and refreshing. So we have the, the side 10 that we've infused with a little bit of cucumber um, to kind of highlight the honeydew melon. And then we mix it in with a little bit of lemon verbena syrup, um, just because we are in San Francisco and uh, we have very luck and fortunate to have a lot of awesome citrus and uh, herbs and botanicals. Lemon verbena is awesome kicking, but obviously we don't have any right now because it's December. So uh, we just kind of kind of gear shifting it to a little bit of uh, a mix of uh, herbs and uh, verbena there. And then uh, you want to balance it out with a little bit of lemon juice because uh, we're going to make a long cocktail. Uh, and then all together, we have a little bit of lemon verbena bitters. Um, so it's taking those herbs, letting it sit in uh, a little, little bit of Everclear to pull out all and extract all of those flavors. Anything a little higher proof pulls all those flavors out for you. Uh, and then I'm gonna fill my tin up with, with ice. And we're gonna strain this into a nice long cocktail again. We're going super, super festive. So we've got we've got uh, Santa Claus and his reindeer over here. Not typical glassware for PCTH, but for this time for the holidays, it's something we're gonna use. Ho, uh, so ho, ho, ho to. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so just fill that Collins glass up and we're just gonna fine strain uh, the cocktail into the Collins glass here. Just get all those ice chunks out, keep it nice and clean. Uh, and then I'm going to top it off with one of my favorite brands, the Camino Yuzu Soda. Uh, they make an amazing line of sodas from Apple to Yuzu uh, to Ume as well. Uh, and this is what's really going to tie everything together. It makes a little long and nice, refreshing cocktail. Uh, of course, you want to give it a little gentle stir, incorporate all those bubbles and the flavors together. Nice little top off there. Uh, and what you have left over is uh, the 1,000 cranes in our super festive holiday glassware, which is awesome and delicious. So the cocktail itself, you're pulling it together, right? Savory with a little bit of citrus and refreshing. So lemon verbena, those honeydew melon notes, cucumber, a little bit of that salty brininess that comes through and shines. And then it uses soda, which makes it kind of pop. So again, you're going, you're riding that nice fine line of like savory and refreshing at the same time uh, with a little bit of sweetness. And there you have it, the 1,000 grains. Beautiful. That's remarkable. And when you get a shochu, obviously we've been talking about Ichiko today. Uh, me and Aaron later on, we're going to try some uh, Torikai and Yufuin. But when you get a shochu, what's kind of like the process by which you get to know it and then jump into making cocktails with it? Yeah, um, I mean, I think... What I always like to recommend for people, if you're making cocktails with a spirit that you're unfamiliar with, is the best way to kind of wrap your head around it is to take that spirit and introduce it to a cocktail that you know, like a gimlet or a martini or something that's familiar to you. So you know how that spirit's gonna interact with familiar flavors. Um, so you throw it into like a gimlet, like the Saitan to a gimlet, allows you to, to see how the acid interacts with the base spirit, um, throw in some other type of like raspberry syrup or grenadine and seeing how that sweetness plays with it. Um, just tasting it by itself is great because you're going to pull out flavors, but you never know what another modifier or a citrus is going to actually do to that spirit. Um, and that's like my recommendation is just throw into a classic cocktail and see how it interacts with other ingredients. And obviously the percentage makes a difference. It's yes. more challenging, I feel, for, let's say, aging dinosaur bartenders like you and me who are used to full sense spirits to mix with something 25% or less because it's delicate, but that's also an opportunity. Very much, very much. I mean, everything, we're lucky to have something a little more overproof, but obviously um, a search that's a little lower proof um, is, a, 
not to say in a bad way is, is lacking, right? Is, is very, very delicate. So when you add something to it, um, you're losing that, those delicate notes. Um, so if you're looking at using something a little more lower ABV, 25, 25%, you're thinking of, of kind of amping, amping those flavors up. So you know what that base spirit is and you know what those flavors are. So you're trying to figure out how to pull out those flavors. So you want to use something complimentary, 10% to 15% complimentary to those, those base, that base spirit. That makes yeah. Sense. We're very lucky in that people, when we tour Japan, we get to go and see distilleries and we always say, uh, you know, we want stronger show too, basically. And it's coming now. I think the newest one in America premiered at Bar Convent Brooklyn and it's the best-selling and gorgeous Diami shochu, which is now for the first time available at, I think it's 40 or 43% in the USA. Wow. So everybody keep an eye out for that one. Sure, it's available on the West Coast because shochu is one of those rare things where the West Coast often gets it before us here in New York. Oh, we'll take that as a win because usually New York City gets everything before us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, we're used to that thing. You know what? I think we're on a bit of a roll here now. So I'd like to do another uh, tasting and a little chat uh, with Aaron. Aaron, you've got some stuff that I think only you and me have uh, to taste, right? The Yufuin and the uh, Torakai, yes? Yes, sir. Brilliant. There it's we go. Good. Yeah, I'm getting uh, red licorice on the nose. This is a highly polished rice. Um, it's uh, tropical, I'm getting tropical notes. Um, it's fruity. It is, it's got that lovely characteristic rice nose, but I'm expecting a little delicacy here because I can see it's low pressure distillation. And also they're using yellow koji, which tends to produce, you know, a less muscular than black or even white koji. Oh, tons of fruit, tons of us. Like a little drop of sugar and nobody would believe this wasn't a liqueur. Mm. Like this, I, I like a nice strong shochu or awamori, but this is delicious. You would drink this by the goblet. All day. And where would you, you well, I know you're not demonstrating a, a cocktail right away, but is, is your thought process similar to Kevin's when you taste a shochu and you're thinking about eventually using it in a cocktail? Yeah, you, you want the shochu to shine. You don't want to cover it up with anything. And Kevin's absolutely right with trying a cocktail that, that you know and to try the spirit with that and see how it shines. Um, I found out that's what I've been doing for the past few days is tinkering with this product and trying to come up with the best cocktail I could come up with. And it seems like I really want this spirit to shine and I'm trying not to use anything too aggressive to overpower it. Yeah, we had a great session last week with no, nobody less than Kenta Goto of Bar Goto. And by the way, you can see this if you go to uh, at JSS underscore Shochu, that's at JSS underscore Shochu on Instagram. There's a link back because Kenta presented his adjusted ratios for making Shochu cocktails. He took you know, Dale DeGroff's famous sour ratios of two ounces, three quarters, three quarters. And he basically says, you've got to up the alcohol, what is 20, the amount of alcohol when it's 24% shochu and uh, actually reduce the, the sugar and citrus components yeah. to do exactly what you said, which is let the shochu shine. Sir. So let's hang on to this uh, idea of Torikai, this uh, fantastic, you know, I would say a powerhouse, but you know it's not overwhelming either. And go on to uh, Yufuin. This is the Yufuin White Label. They do have different uh, bottlings out there. What we're dealing with here is twenty percent uh, alcohol shochu from Oita, a major uh, shochu producing city, and we've got Muki shochu, barley shochu which should be a nice, easy sort of a, how can I say it, a, a bridge to people who might like drinking other barley spirits like, ooh, I don't know, whiskey. So how do you taste your way through this, Aaron? It's, it's definitely, it's very fruit forward. Um, it's on the palate, it's earthy. Um, 
it's really well-rounded, it's delicious. Yeah, there is an earthiness, isn't there? It's very much a, a sort of a, an up, it's so, it's so elegant, it's so delicate. This would be very difficult to mix with in a way. Yeah. yeah Where does your mind go with this? It. Yeah. What do you think you would do with this? I think I would just put some hot water on that. Yeah. But I also would think of this, you know, try to work with a martini template, but obviously I'd really drop the amount of any uh, vermouth I added. There'd be no bitters. You know, I'd want to have this. Yeah, it might only be 40 proof, but there's a really powerful aroma there. Mm -hmm. It's a little, uh, it's a little powerhouse this. And what we might see in the future is more and more innovation in barley shochu, because in a couple of years, the rule change in Japan will come into effect that means that uh, Japanese whiskey has to be entirely barley based, has to be grown and bottled in Japan and all that, because currently some barley shochu is actually exported and sold as Japanese whiskey. And within Japan, if you age uh, barley shochu in wooden barrels it's only allowed to achieve a certain level of colour it can't be any darker than that so as not to come into confusion with uh, with Japanese whiskies. so if they're not going to be exporting barley shochu as uh, whiskey, maybe that production expertise will turn inwards and we'll see more innovation with shochu that'd be great I'd love to see like an age, age shochu come out and like kind of play with barrels. It'd be really neat to see what different types of barrels, like French limousine to, to everything, to see sherry and see what the end result of, of sochu, especially with koji and seeing how the koji interacts with different barrels. Like that's just such a huge rabbit hole to go down to where it's just like, you know, having a, a sweet potato base and throwing that into a barrel. Throwing so many different things into a barrel to see what it does is, is very exciting. Yeah, I mean, for instance, um, even apart from those things, a lot of the producers are doing really cool stuff. Like, for instance, uh, Ichiko Saisen is a two-row barley, and they propagate the koji on barley as well. So it's all barley all the time. Uh, Dayame have their own strain of sweet potato that they've created. So their shochu tastes like the freshest, most delicious uh, lychee that you've ever had in your life. And of course... Awesome. the barrel aging expertise, especially if you're doing it down south where it's tropical. And we all know that tropical aging is very difficult to aging somewhere cold, like uh, Scotland or Ireland or wherever. There's a world of innovation waiting out there, you know? So I think there's lots of stuff that we're looking forward to seeing uh, coming our way. Uh, if anyone has any questions for Aaron or Kevin, now is the time to do it. So please, throw them up there in the chat. And while you're typing away, I'm just gonna remind everybody who's tuned in to follow on Instagram at JSS underscore Shochu. That's at JSS underscore Shochu for all the details of current, forthcoming and past webinars that we've done. You can also find details of the cocktail contest that could see you going to Japan on www.shochu.guide. That's www.shochu.guide. And you'll be able to also ask questions there. If you don't think of anything, you'll be able to see these seminars. They'll be lightly edited and available to watch again, complete with all the recipes from uh, Kevin and our other presenters and tasting notes and whatnot. So I don't know if there's any questions. One of my colleagues here is also monitoring the Instagram feed uh, to see uh, what's going on. So Aaron, while I have you here, uh, did you prepare a cocktail for us? Absolutely did. Brilliant. Little, so little I don't want- the Print 75. Oh, brilliant. Do you want to take us over the jumps on that one? Absolutely. So I'm using the Tori Kai. Um, and well, I told you I was playing around a lot last week with it and a lot of the classic cocktails that I was styling it out from was the flavors were just too aggressive uh, and just overpowered the sake for me. 
um, I really wanted to shine. So what I came up with now, um, it's, it's kind of more off of a um, old Cuban cocktail. Uh, so I'm using lime juice, shiso, um, a little falernum, and like we're talking bar spoon, just a hint, plum bitters, and I'm topping it with prosciutto, sparkling, and I'm, I'm using uh, like a soda stream to put bubbles onto the prosciutto to top the cocktail. Oh, brilliant. So can we see it? Of course, let's do it. <laughs> I love the use of a soda stream. It's, it's, it's fantastic. Hey, when you're done, you can just walk it. You can walk it five blocks over here and I'll yeah, drink absolutely. the rest of it. Yeah. That's <laughs> uh, San Francisco. Send it with Postmates. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so this one, uh, the one I've been playing with, I wanted a little deeper, richer flavor uh, than just plain lime juice. So I took black lime, which is part of a Persian cuisine. And I, uh, I'm infusing my shochu with the black lime just to give it a little more depth. And we're literally going with a bar spoon of lime juice and a bar spoon of the good old velvet flarenum. So I was using a house made flarenum, but I want everybody at home to be able to make this one. So I'm sure this product is readily available. Give the sochi a little hit, bring out the oils. And I'm stirring this one just because I don't want it to be too watered down. Normally with anything with juice, I'm gonna shake it, but it's just a bar spoon. It just works out really well. I'm just going to use about an ounce in the soda stream. A little gas here. And that's the one right there. That's a gorgeous drink. And I see that you are on the uh, one side of the religious war, which is uh, large ice in coops. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's I was going to I was going to comment on that, but I'll let Phillips moderate it. So <laughs> I was just like, which side of the fence are we going? Are we swinging yeah. for here? I'm trying to be a moderate moderator. I'm not judging here, but uh... well, the big sphere is not going to melt down too fast and keep your drink chilled while you're sipping. So uh, it's just it's a wonderful cocktail. I'm really happy happy with it. I've uh, been working on it for like a week now. So uh, really, really having fun with it. And it's a beautiful drink. It's something that you know by its nature and its size would encourage people. And not for nothing. Not that high in alcohol, zero sugar, zero carbs, especially on the left coast. I think that's a selling point. Yes, sir. Yeah. And no, no hangover, right? If it has. That's a, great. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, uh, I would never say that. <laughs> especially not in the most litigious country in the world. So. All right. You well, heard guys. it here first. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I don't, I don't think we've got any questions popping up. So uh, with, we're going to wrap this up. I want to remind everybody to follow on Instagram at JSS underscore Shochu and to visit www.shochu.guide to learn all about the Kyushu Shochu Makers Association competition that could see you going to Japan, hopefully as soon as next year with people like myself and uh, Kevin and Aaron, oh my God, wait a second, we've got some questions. Da, 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 da. 
Uh, it seems Koji plays a big role in making flavor profiles, but how about the role of yeast? I've seen barley shochu made with white wine yeast. Great question. Absolutely, uh, completely valid too. Thank you, Yoko D. Uh, yeast is as important with shochu as it is with anything else. And many shochu producers have their own yeast, just like whiskey producers do and rum producers. But if in shochu, you've got something that yeast has to share the stage with, and that's called koji. And especially in the last 10 years, we've seen a huge uptick in interest in the use of koji, uh, driven a lot from the culinary world, restaurants like Noma in Copenhagen, who have their own fermentation lab, and actually their research chefs have published the uh, Noma Guide to Fermentation, which is like one of those Bible books. Uh, these days, in every cocktail bar, somebody is fermenting some ingredients. Uh, I bartended so long ago that if something was fermenting behind the bar, you got fired because you had not been uh, cleaning well enough. But now it's huge and people realize, well, that's how we get soy sauce and that's how we get kombucha and that's how we get other things. So it's a new dimension of flavor, both for spirits producers, like our shochu producers, and also for bartenders. So yeast is, is really important. It will continue to be really important and uh, we'll continue to learn more about koji and see more innovation with koji as well. So great question, Yoko, thank you very much. And I wanna remind everybody that we're gonna have a lightly edited version of this Zoom up very soon. If you follow on Instagram at JSS underscore Shochu, you'll know when it's up there with Aaron and Kevin's recipes and more uh, tasting notes on everything that we've tried and links to all these things. So yeah, that's kind of it, everybody. Thank you very, very much. So on behalf of Kevin at Miracle PCH and Aaron at <laughs> Pabu Izakaya and everyone at the Japan Sake and Shochu Makers Association and myself here in New York, where the weather is terrible. Uh, thank you very much for uh, tuning in and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Cheers, everybody.